जय राधा माधवा कुंज भी हरे राधा कुंज भी हरे जय राधा माधवा कुंज भी हरे गोपी जना बला गिरी भर धारी गोपी जना बला गिरी भर धारी गोपी जना बला जसोद नंदना ब्रज चंद्रंजना जसोद नंदना ब्रज चंद्रंजना नंदना ब्रज जामुनाधीरा जाधी जाय राधमाधा शुंजी हाधी माधा जाय राधा माधवा कुंज भी हरे माधवा कुंज भी हरे गोपीचना भला गोपीचना भला गोपी जना बला गिरी बर धारी गोपी जना बला गिरी बर धारी जसोर नंदना ब्रज जन रंजना जसोद नंदना ब्रज जन रंजना जामुना जाय राधा माधवा कुंज भी हरी जाय राधा माधवा कुंज भी हरी ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय वी गोइंग टू कवर टू चैप्टर्स वन इज जस्ट अ समरी ऑफ समथिंग कवर्ड अर्लियर चैप्टर 12 बट इट्स स्टिल 
Nitai's childhood pastimes. And chapter 11 is his meeting with Ishwara Puri. Now, a little bit of a something from yesterday in chapter 10. There was um, mention of Morari Gupta. Where is he? He's in the car. Okay, you tell him. Morari Gupta was mentioned yesterday in chapter 10 as being um, an expansion of Rudra. And there was a question, what's that about? So a little research. In Chaitanya Charitamrita, it says repeatedly that Marari Gupta is an incarnation of Hanuman. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu personally said it, incarnation of Hanuman. In Gauragonda Desh Dipika, which is a book by Kavi Karnapur, it's kind of a who's who, Gauralila Krishna Lila, Marari Gupta is an incarnation of Hanuman. In Chaitanya Bhagavat, Vrindavan Das Thakur says he is an incarnation of Rudra. No, so I looked to see is there any commentary. The only commentary I found was in the chapter summary by Bhakti Siddhanta. He goes a little bit further and says he's a plenary incarnation of Rudra meaning like Nirvasa Muni is a partial and Murari Gupta is plenary. No explanation why it says this here and that there. I mean, how how such persons, how how are, because there was some discussion that even during the time of um, Vrindavan Das Thakur, he was understanding many things about who's who, without going into details. How did these personalities understand who's who? And the answer is by revelation. And uh, one example is, let's see, just going through this today. Oh, yeah, not yesterday, two days ago. Ramananda Roy is said to be three different people or personalities. Some say this, some say that, some some say the other. And then in Gauragonda Desh Tapika, the learned persons say all three. So how do you get that? And how do they get even one, what to speak of three? Uh, there's an explanation. One explanation is from Brahma Samhita that re- the, such realizations, Bhakti Siddhanta translates from ch- chap- uh, text 61 of Brahma Samhita, Yadrashi Yadrashi Shraddha Siddhi Bhavati. Tadrashi Siddhi, he translates as realization. So different acharyas get different realizations according to Shraddha. That's one explanation. They get their realization, and their realization is their realization, and they write their realization. And But it's not speculation, it's realization. It's Krishna reveals something to them according to their faith. There's another text that says something quite similar. Um, it's, it's, it ends, uh, Siddhi Bhavati Tadrashi, which is a, a text by a, um, it's floating around these days in ISKCON circles, a, a Vaishnav 
10th century Vaishnav author, poet, wrote a wonderful poem about Krishna. And he indicates that there are, it's important, there are six things, six objects of meditation realization that one gets an experience of or a, a realization of reciprocation from according to faith. Same point. Your deity, your mantra, your guru, your physician, two others, I can't recall. But, you know, the, the, the realization and reciprocation that comes is corresponding to one's faith. For, for those of us that like things, it's either this or it's that, we struggle. But it doesn't have to be either this or that. It can be according to realization. And the preponderance about Murari Gupta is he's Hanuman. <laughs> and that certainly makes sense because he was a Rambhakta, well-known Ram Bhakta. But we don't dismiss Vrindavan Das Thakur as being like, we just, that he can't be Hanuman and Rudra, so he's, you know, he's got to be wrong. And so we, we discredit everything that Vrindavan Das. We don't do that. That would be a mistake. It would be offensive. We can say, I don't understand, and he has this realization, and we respect his realization. And we'll go on to chapter 11. <laughs> it, is a, it is a situation to... to uh, it's really simple just reading Prabhupada's Bhaktivedanta purports because everything is consistent. However, even in Prabhupada's Bhaktivedanta purports, sometimes he'll say this and sometimes he'll say that. And if you're reading carefully, you'll notice, not very often, consistently, it's this, or it's that, but sometimes there is inconsistency. There's a really nice example from Bhagavad Gita. Um, Bhagavad Gita chapter one, text number something or other, something like 36 where Valade Vidyavasan and Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur take exactly the opposite meaning. It, it, it's, it's the statement where uh, Duryodhana is assessing his army against the Pandava's army, and he assesses that his army will be victorious because, and it gives, there's, I, I forget the, the, the exact Sanskrit words, but, but the way that Valadeva and the way of the Vishwanath read the verse, it's exactly opposite. And they're not disrespecting each other. And, you know, if it's this, it's this. And if it's that, it's that. It can't. Acharyas will have different realizations. It happens. So if, if we go on in our um, reading of Vaishnava literature and things that Prabhupada recommends for us to read, we'll come across things like that more than if we just read the Bhaktivedanta purports and everything is really the one or zero. Our little binary processor really handles that one or zero program very well. We invest our faith in Prabhupada and he's giving us it's a one or it's a zero. And that's fine. Yet he also indicates that our acharyas can have differing points of view, and it doesn't mean that there's something wrong. Baladev wrote subsequent to Vishwanath. He was he was his shiksha disciple, and in that particular verse, Baladev writes Vishwanath wrote that, and he writes this. But he's not saying because it's this, it can't be that. He doesn't say he's wrong. There's, there's, there's renderings of Sanskrit terminology 
that can be quite different. And that's just fine. There's, um, I just made, made a note today. There in Gopal Tapani Upanishad, it's a very special Upanishad, especially appreciated by Vaishnava and Gaudiya Vaishnavas. It's a place where Durvasa is speaking to Radha about Krishna in Gauragunad Vaishtapika. And there's a, there's a long verse, and one of the phrases of the verse can be read this way, that way, or that way. Jiva Goswami reads it this way, Rupa Goswami reads it that way, and Sanatana Goswami reads it a different way. And there, you know, the Sanskrit, it's in the boundaries of the proper rendering of the Sanskrit. And it's so the Sanskrit is striking their heart in a certain way, or that they have faith. It's, it's describing Krishna who's on the banks of the river Jamuna. I mean, that's one of the renderings. That, that it's very clear from the Sanskrit. But another, that's also a, a, a grammatically correct, and Sanskrit-wise correct, um, he is the soul of Vrindavan, as is the Jamuna, the soul of Vrindavan, something like that. And then another rendering has something to do completely different. Although it's spoken by Dravasa Tarata, it's, it's rendered by Sanatana Goswami to speak about Lord Ramachandra. I, why am I doing this? It happens. So can make sure your seat belt is fastened and, and these things happen. That is, our, our great, uh, uh, those who we revere the most, they have uh, different relationships with, with Krishna. And in many cases, they're, you know, they're, they say the same thing. And in some cases, they say something slightly different. And sometimes they say something quite different. And that's part of their relationship with Krishna, which is beautiful, not disturbing. It's part of, you know, entrance into the, the realm of rasa that's not just binary. It, it's quite fluid and dynamic and lovely. And that's um, part of our version of life as we go along and move outside that, you know, the, 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 um, the beginning stages of sadhana bhakti, we find there's a, there's a whole world of, um, great Vaishnavas, even within our line and Vaishnavas outside of our line that have, uh, love for Krishna, love for the personality of God, had love for, love for Bhagavan and his different features and that their love brings realizations to them. We, we, it's wonderful. Okay. And we, we may have our preference. I, I like, you know, Rari Gupta's Hanuman. Okay. So this is now uh, Lord Chaitanya's meeting with Ishwar Puri. They're still in, in uh, Navadweep. He's, he's young. He's a grammar student and teacher. He's learned from Gangadas Pandit, his teacher, everything quickly. And he's been engaged in debate and, you know, wrangling with, his, with other teachers and students of other teachers and even his own students. That was this, you know, discussion with Murari Gupta. He would, he, you know, Murari Gupta didn't like engaging in debate with Nimai. He had affection for him. He didn't want to do a debate with him. So Nimai would, like, you know, prod him with his finger and say, you know, what did you learn today? And I'll tell you where it was wrong. <laughs> anyway. All glories to Sri Gorachandra, the Lord of Lords. In his childhood, he was the reservoir of scholastic pastimes. His form was as enchanting as millions of cupids. Each of his limbs was in 
incomparably charming. His arms extended to his knees, and his eyes were like petals of a lotus. He chewed betel nut and dressed divinely. His form was enchanting, as enchanting as millions of cubits. It starts the same way as the previous line. It's sung. It's like a refrain. As the Lord walked with thousands of students, by the strength of his knowledge, he entertained everyone with his sharp wit. Vishwambar, the Lord of the Three Worlds, traveled all over Navadvip, holding in his hand his beloved Saraswati in the form of a book. There was no scholar throughout Navadvip who could understand Imai's explanations. The Lord discussed his explanations only with the most fortunate Gangadas Pandit, his teacher. All the materialistic people said, Oh, the parents of this boy are certainly glorious. What can they be lacking? All the ladies considered the Lord to be as attractive as Cupid, and the atheists considered him as death personified. All the learned scholars considered him equal to Brahaspati in this way. Everyone appreciated the Lord according to their own mentality. Seeing Vishwambar's attractive form, the Vaishnavas felt jubilation, and lamentation, they thought. Although he has such a divine body, he has no attraction for Krishna. What good is his education if he simply wastes his time? All the Vaishnavas were bewildered by the internal potency of the Lord, so even though they saw the Lord, they didn't understand who he was. Although they directly saw the Lord, some of them said, why do you waste your time in fruitless pursuit of knowledge? The Lord smiled on hearing his servants speak like this, and he replied, I am fortunate to have you instruct me. As the Lord thus passed his time in scholastic pastimes, his servants could not recognize him. So what to speak of others? People came from all over India to study in Navadvip, for if one studied in Navadvip, he got a taste for education. Many Vaishnavas came from Chattagram to live on the bank of the Ganges and study in Navadvip. They were all renounced devotees of Krishna and had taken birth in order by the order of the Lord. <laughs> After school hours, they regularly met together in a solitary place to discuss topics of Lord Krishna. Sri Mukunda was most dear to all the Vaishnavas, their hearts all melted when he sang. In the afternoon, all the devotees regularly met at the house of Advaita Prabhu. As soon as Mukunda would begin singing about Krishna, everyone there fell on the ground in ecstatic love. Some of them cried, some laughed, others danced. The clothes of some person scattered as they rolled on the ground. Someone roared as he challenged the agents of Maya, and someone else caught hold of Mukunda's feet in this way. The Vaishnavas enjoyed great ecstasy and forgot all forms of distress. The Lord was most satisfied with Mukunda. Whenever the Lord saw him, he would stop him. Guess what? He would debate. The Lord would then ask Mukunda for some clarification at a point, and when Mukunda answered him, the Lord would say, Wrong! And immediately an argument would begin. By the mercy of the Lord, Mukunda was very learned. Thus, he was able to present arguments and counter-arguments to Nimai's challenges. In this way, the Lord recognized his devotees by challenging them for clarification on some point, but they were all defeated in the ensuing argument. Srivas and other devotees were all challenged in this way, but they would all run away in fear of wasting time in useless arguments. The devotees were naturally detached due to their advancement in Krishna consciousness. They did not care to hear anything other than the topics related with Lord Krishna. By the way, uh, it's um, while he did this in his childhood, later when he visited, visits Udupi, uh, he found and, and comments directly in Chaitanya Charitamrita that the, the, the followers of Madhvacharya by that point in time 
were um, very much engrossed in disagreement and disputa- disputing the teachings of Shankara, and they were very much involved in logical refu- refutation of points. And Lord Chaitanya's comment was, you know, you're you're wasting time in all of this argumentation and logical debate, which he was he was doing in his childhood, and they were commenting like that to him out of you know appreciation or for help. But he said one thing is you accept Krishna as the as the supreme Lord, which is what the, the first and foremost of all of Madhva's teachings. That Hari is the topmost person. So that he he had appreciation for. Their Bhagavat Siddhanta is is the foundation of Lord Chaitanya's teachings also. Okay, text thirty four. As soon as the Lord saw any devotee, he would challenge him. And when he failed to give the correct response, the Lord would tease him. If any of them saw the Lord coming in the distance, they would run Away out of fear of being challenged, the devotees all loved to hear the topics concerning Lord Krishna, but Nimai didn't mention anything about Krishna when he challenged them. One day, as Nimai walked on the main street with his students, he displayed symptoms of great pride. At that time, Mukunda was on his way to take bath in the Ganges, but when he saw Nimai coming, he ran away. Seeing this, the Lord inquired from Govinda, why did this boy run away upon seeing me? Govinda replied, Oh, Pandit, I don't know. Perhaps he went somewhere for some work. The Lord said, I know the reason why he's avoiding me. He does not want to speak with a non-devotee. This boy studies only Vaishnava literature, while I explain only Panji, Vritti, and Dika. I do not speak anything about Krishna, therefore he ran away when he saw me. The Lord called Mukunda some ill names. Yet he was actually satisfied with him. At the same time, he indirectly disclosed his identity. The Lord said, My dear boy, how long will you avoid my clutches? Do you think you'll escape my association by running away? Smiling, the Lord said, When I finish my studies, then... You will all see my Vaishnava qualities. I will be such a Vaishnava that Brahma and Shiva will come to my door. My dear brothers, listen to me. I will certainly become an extraordinary Vaishnava. Those who run away from me today will chant my glories and qualities tomorrow. After speaking in this way, Nimai smiled and returned home with his students. Who can understand these pastimes enjoyed by Lord Vishrambar unless he reveals them? In this way, the devotees resided in Navadvip, which was filled with people intoxicated with wealth and children. As soon as such people heard the devotees' kirtan, they taunted the devotees. Someone said, This is just a means for filling their stomachs. Another said, They have given up the cultivation of knowledge to dance like madmen. What kind of behavior is this? Someone else said, I have studied Srimad Bhagavatam for a long time, but I've never found any mention of dancing or crying as a spiritual path. My dear brothers, because of Srivas and his three brothers, we cannot sleep. After eating, is there no piety in softly chanting Krishna's names? Must one chant, dance, and shout loudly? In this way, all the sinful atheists abused the Vaishnavas whenever they saw them. Hearing their abusive words, the devotees were greatly distressed. They would chant Krishna's name and cry loudly. Oh, how long will this miserable condition last? Oh, Krishna Chandra, please manifest yourself to these people. The Vaishnavas all told the Dvaita Prabhu about the abusive words of the atheists. Hearing their account, Dvaita Chari became as angry as Lord Rudra and loudly exclaimed, I will kill them all! My Lord, who carries a chakra, is coming. Then you will see what happens in Nadia. I will make Krishna appear before the eyes of all. Then this person named Advaita will be known as the servant of Krishna. Please wait a few more days, my dear brothers, and you will see Krishna right here. 
After hearing the words of Advaita, all the devotees forgot their distress and began kirtan. As the auspicious sound of Krishna's name arose, Advaita and the other devotees became overwhelmed. The pains caused by the atheist abusive words were mitigated as the city of Navadri became filled with ecstasy. Lord Vishrambar happily passed his days in study and always increased the joy of Mother Sachi. In the meantime, Sri Ishwarapuri came in disguise to Navadvip. He was overwhelmed with love for Krishna. He was most merciful and dear to the Lord Krishna. Wearing that dress, no one would recognize him as he arrived by providence at the house of Advaita. He humbly sat down close to where Advaita Prabhu was performing his puja. The, inf- the effulgence of a Vaishnav cannot be hidden from another Vaishnav, and therefore Advaita Prabhu looked at him again and again. Advaita then said, Dear Prabhu, who are you? I think you are a Vaishnav sannyasi. Ishwar Puri replied, I am lower than a Sudra. I have come here simply to see your lotus feet. Understanding the situation, Mukunda began to sing a song about Krishna with great devotion. As the sound of Mukunda singing entered his ears, Ishwar Puri fell to the ground. Incessant tears flowed from his eyes, and the waves of love increased again and again. Advaita Prabhu hastily took him in his arms, and his entire body became wet with tears. The symptoms of ecstatic love continued to increase rather than diminish as Mukunda began to loudly recite appropriate verses. The Vaishnava's hearts were filled with incomparable happiness as they saw their transformations of ecstatic love later. When they learned that he was Ishwar Puri, the devotees all remembered Lord Hari. In this way, as Ishwar Puri wandered about Navadweep in disguise, no one was able to recognize him. One day, as Sri Gorasundar was returning home from school, by providence he met Sri Ishwar Puri. Seeing his eternal servant, the Lord offered him, offered him obeisances. Now, he becomes his guru, but he's the eternal servant of the Lord. <laughs> Vishwambar's personal beauty was indescribable. He was the reservoir of all extraordinary qualities. Although people did not know his real identity, they nevertheless had great respect for him. When Ishwar Puri saw Nimai's features, he could understand that Nimai was a most grave and exalted personality. Ishwar Puri inquired, O oh, best of the Brahmanas, what is your name? What are you studying and teaching? And where do you live? When the others replied, He's Nimai Pandit. Ishwara Puri joyfully said, So, you are Nimai. The Lord invited, because he had heard about him. The Lord invited Ishwara Puri for lunch and then respectfully brought him home. Mother Sashi prepared an offering for Krishna and after honoring the prasad, Ishwara Puri sat in the temple room. Thereafter, Ishwara Puri became fully absorbed while describing topics of Lord Krishna. The Lord was satisfied to see his unprecedented symptoms of love, which he did not disclose due to people's misfortunate position. Ishwar Puri stayed for a few months in Navadweep at the home of Gopinathacharya. Gopinathacharya. Gopinathacharya shows up later in Puri the brother-in-law of Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya. So, but Gopinathacharya was previously in Navadvipa and he knew everybody. Not just by name, he knew you know, in an intimate way all the devotees. So Gopinathacharya was the one who introduced person by person to the king. Here's this one, here's that one, here's the other one. Everyone was overjoyed to see him, Ishwar Puri, and the Lord would also regularly go visit him. Nimai would go visit. Seeing Gadadhar Pandit's tears of love, all the Vaishnavas felt great affection for him. He was detached from worldly life since childhood. Therefore, Ishwar Puri felt similar affection for him. 
he had Gadadha Pandit study a book that he had written named Krishna Lilamrita. That's the title of, of Ishwar Puri's book. After studying and teaching, the Lord went in the evening to offer his obeisances to Ishwar Puri. Ishwar Puri was happy to see Nimai, and though he did not know him as the Supreme Lord, he still had love for him. Ishwar Puri smiled and said, You're a big scholar. I've written a book about the characteristics of Lord Krishna. I would be most satisfied if you would tell me if there is any fault in it, the Lord replied. Whoever finds fault in a devotee's description of Lord Krishna is a sinful person. Krishna is certainly pleased with his devotee's poetry, even though it is imperfectly composed. An uneducated person may chant Vishnaya, while a sober person will chant the proper form Vishnave. But the Supreme Lord Krishna will accept both forms when they are chanted with devotion. At the time of offering obeisances to Lord Vishnu, a foolish person chants Vishnaya Namaha. It's faulty grammar. And a learned person chants Vishnave Namaha. Correct grammar. But both achieve equal piety by their offering obeisances because Lord Sri Janardana sees the sentiment of the living being. In other words, he sees the degree of devotion, or in other words, he awards the results accordingly. Similar to what we mentioned at the beginning, according to faith or according to devotion. Because devotion is just degrees of faith in one sense. He does not see one's foolishness or unintelligence. One who finds fault with a devotee is himself at fault, for a devotee's descriptions are meant only for the pleasure of Krishna. Therefore, who will dare find fault with your devotional descriptions of Krishna's pastimes? Hearing Nimai's reply was like a shower of nectar on the body of Ishwar Puri. He then smiled and said, You will not be at fault, but you must tell me if there is any error in the book. Thereafter, Nimai would daily sit with Ishwar Puri for one or two hours to discuss his book. And that went on for quite some time, right? A few months. After hearing his poetry one day, the Lord smiled and said, the, the dato verbal root of this sentence is incorrect. The atmane padi form should not be used here. After saying this, the Lord returned home. Ishwar Puri was a learning scholar in the scriptures and he enjoyed analyzing scholastic topics. After Nimai left, Ishwar Puri considered the verbal root that he had used and came to the conclusion from many different angles. He left the verb in its Atmanipadi form. And when Nimai came the next day, he explained, I have concluded the verb that you said yesterday should be Paras Mai Padi should remain Atmane Padi. And there's a long Bhakti Siddhanta technical commentary on this or that. When the Lord heard his explanation, if it was somebody else, he'd refute and pin them to the ground and ask them to say what was wrong and they couldn't and then he would say where it was wrong and establish something else. That was his program. But with Ishwar Puri he was happy to be defeated. When the Lord heard his explanation, that's Ishwar Puri's explanation, he was most satisfied with his servant's victory, and he did not find any further fault. The Vedas declare that the Lord by nature always expands his devotees' glories by making them victorious. In this way, Ishwar Puri passed a few months enjoying scholastic pastimes with Sri Gorachandra. Ishwar Puri, however, would not remain in one place due to the restless nature of his ecstatic love. Thus he went out on pilgrimage to purify the earth. Whoever hears the auspicious topics of Sri Ishwar Puri lives at the lotus feet of Lord Krishna. Sri Madhavendra Puri happily gave the complete treasure of ecstatic love to Sri Ishwar Puri. 
By the mercy of Krishna, Sri Ishwarapur, he obtained love of God from his spiritual master. So he traveled free from all anxieties. Accepting Sri Chaitanya and Nityananda Prabhu as my life and soul, I Vrindavan Das sing the glories of their lotus feet. We touched on this yesterday. I'll mention it again because it's coming up. The disappearance day of Madhavendra Puri. And several places, one we read right in Chaitanya Bhagavat, is that Madhavendra Puri is accepted as the, um, I think the word that's used is the root of ecstatic love for Krishna. And he passed that on to Ishwar Puri, and Ishwar Puri passed it on to Lord Chaitanya. But, you know, it's not that Lord Chaitanya needed to receive anything from anybody. So how was it that Madhavendra Puri, the, the Diksha Guru of Madhavendra Puri, we discussed this, is Lakshmi Pati Tirtha. Lakshmi Pati Tirtha was also the Diksha Guru of Lord Nityananda. Then later, Lord Nityananda met Madhavendra Puri. Later, Madhavendra Puri gave Diksha to Advaita Acharya. But so, similarly, the interaction with Ishwar Puri. That, you know, the, the circle of Vaishnavas, uh, you know, infected each other <laughs> in a good sense with love of God. But Madhavendra Puri is a very important person because he was inspired by Krishna to manifest this ecstatic love in the way that he did. It was purposeful and, you know, utilitarian or it was it was to nourish the pastimes of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu that he'd be like one of us, that is to say, you know, a, a mortal being or as a, you know, a, 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 a Brahmin-born a scholar who became a great Vaishnav by his service, by hearing from Ishra, because that's where it started. By Leela, that's where it started. He was doing some service, and he was hearing. That's, you know, that's, the, that's the Bhagavad Gita formula. Tadvidi pranipati na pariprashne na sevaya. And it culminated later with with initiation, and things just exploded after that. That's Leela. And Madhavendra Puri is an important person in that Leela. But the, the, the whole of the gift of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu in his Leela, you know, when we're explaining to beginning people, it's to teach everyone how to surrender to Krishna, the Sarvadharmam verse, how to do it practically speaking, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu showed how to become Krishna's devotee. But even more specifically, um, that in, in, in the mature stage, the, the, a devotee that's a lover of Krishna in the mood of the resident of Vrindavan, and the seed for that, or the root for that, came from Madhavendra Puri through Ishwar Puri. And so it's just the, the stages of all of this taking place. Like later, in this Adikanda, because the Kanda changes after initiation, becomes Majikanda, is when he goes to Gaya on the pretext of his father's Shraddha, uh, there, there's a similar s- set of important things. He, he takes... Um, water from the feet of the brahmanas. He gets fever. Nothing works to cure the fever. The students are in anxiety. Nimai makes his own recommendation. The recommendation is he just needs to drink some water that's washed the feet of a brahmana. They're all brahmana boys. So that, then his, his fever breaks. Then he sees the, the feet the celebrated feet of Vishnu and Gaya that one who is doing Shraddha should do first to see the feet of footprints of Vishnu. 
And when he was there, the brahmanas were reciting prayers, honoring the lotus feet of Vishnu. So hearing, step by step. Then he was cooking after doing his um, rituals with Ingaya for his shraddha for his father. Then he was cooking and Ishwarapuri came and immediately he offered what everything to Ishwarapuri who declined saying, no, no, you have to eat. So I'll cook again. So it's, it's service, uh, taking mercy, hearing, and sequence, sequence, sequence. All these different steps prior to his the formal diksha. It's, it's, it's not shouted off the rooftops in the past times, but the, all the elements are there in his teaching how to come to the stage of devotional service because previously he was not. He was getting blessings. Oh, when that day comes that you become a devotee, oh, thank you for your blessings. One day I will. Taking blessings, rendering service, hearing, and so forth. All those elements are there. The next chapter, 12, I'm just going to really quickly summarize, and then we'll end. Uh, I'm quickly summarizing because before coming to this area, I was in Naperville, and we started the same procedure, this re reciting and reading from Chaitanya Bhagavat. So there we read that chapter. It's, it's a, I like the chapter very, very much. It starts in a similar way. He, he sets the ground of Nimai in his scholastic pastimes, doing this and that, doing mischievous things sometimes, doing respectful things sometimes, and then teaching his students, and the students were all loving him because he was like super teacher. And then he'd take his bath in the Ganga, going home and have lunch, and then he'd go to the marketplace. So it describes when he would go to the marketplace. But then it turns out he went to every home in, in Navadweep, and some was this merchant, some was that merchant. And he would, the, the leela he would perform was he would ask them, show me one of your conch shells or show me one of your pieces of cloth. And then he would start bargaining with them because they're Vaishas. And then sometimes he would say, uh, you know, what's your price? And then he would say, but I don't have anything. <laughs> I'd say, take it anyways. Or you, you, you can come back whenever you like and... He, he was engaging them in service according to their propensities, guna and karma propensities. And so one of the, the, the really fantastic ones is he went to an astrologer and he asked astrologer, who was I in my previous life? So the astrologer chants his Gopal mantra and he goes into a meditation and he, he sees what he sees. He sees all the different Leela avatars and you know, this and that and the other thing. And he, then he opens his eyes and he's looking at Nimai and Nimai's smiling and said, tell me what you see. And he said, I'll, I'll. He, he didn't answer and went further and he saw Radha, he saw Krishna and Balaram and, you know, I'll tell you tomorrow, come back tomorrow. Nimai's smiling. And in this way, he was engaging everybody. It says specifically, he went to every, every home because apparently people had, their profession was from their home or many people, their profession, their, their occupation was, wasn't a you know, pandemic and you, you work for a company doing IT work <laughs> on your computer from home. But anyway, then it comes to Kolavichar Sridhar. Because that seems to be like you know the the main feature, because of their because of their relationship, and because the other persons weren't devotees, the Kolavechar was a devotee. Now, he was a devotee of the Ganga, he, uh, but he was a devotee of Lord Chaitanya, and as although a devotee of Ganga, he would loudly chant the holy name of Krishna all night long, regularly. And people were, you know, saying bad things. Oh, he's like that because he's 
he's famished and he's just, you know, in in great anxiety because he's so hungry. I wish he would stop making all that noise. You know, the materialist, all that refrain that comes again and again in Chaitanya Bhagavad. But Lord Chaitanya loved him very much and he went to see him according to Chaitanya Bhagavad every day and they would spend an hour or two bickering over, you know, give me a fair price and, you know, you, I, I know you, you actually have a, a great treasury, but I won't disclose this to everybody right now. For now, I'm going to ask you some, and so back and forth and back and forth. You know, why are you so poor? Why are you so poor? You're impoverished. You should just worship the Devi like other people do, and then you'll have sufficient. You said, I have sufficient. Look at this house you live in. It, 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 there's no straw roof. And, you know, in, in, his reply was something very interesting. Kings live in a palace and the birds live in a nest. So they have their home. It wasn't a matter of this or that. He was quite detached. He wasn't, you know, he was prodding him to feel, you know, you're not earning enough. You're not greedy enough. You're not ambitious enough. And he was fully satisfied. But then he would go back again and again into the bartering and negotiating and I'm a Brahmana, you know, you give me a, give me what I want at no price. Give me what I want at a fair price. What's your price? You're charging too much. You know. And and Shridhar would say, You're a Brahmin, you you can't talk like this. You take whatever you want, but leave me alone. <laughs> but it was loving. It's you know, it sounds like not night like loving, but it was loving. Later on, in the in the whole exchange in the Mahaprakash Lila, everyone comes forward and Sridhar is, you know, quite some distance away from where the Mahaprakash Lila is taking place at the house of Srivasanga. So he sends devotees to go find him and just listen to the sound. He's chanting Krishna's name at the dark of night. They follow the sound, they found him. He came. And when he asked Kolavichar Sridhar, accept some benediction from me. I will give you, I'll make you a king with all opulence. No, no, no. I'll give you all eight, eight mystic powers. No, 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 no. I just want to be in your eternal service where you can come and tease me like this all the time. I just want to be engaged in your loving service. He was showing the depth of Shridhar's love. The detachment from abject detachment, like um, Sudama Brahman was totally detached from worldly anything. Kolavichar Shridhar like that, but that's not who Kolavichar Shridhar was in Krishna's Leela. He was one of Krishna's coward friends that had a similar relationship with him. All very mysterious. The Krishna Leela connections, the rasa exchanges, the nature of these different personalities, the kind of love that Lord Chaitanya had for each one and how he would stimulate that love, nourish that love in different, different ways with different, different devotees. Okay, so that's our reading and discussions for the evening. Let's see if there's some comments or questions from anyone. We only do this once a year, <laughs> like you know, absorption in Goralila. Unless you're Varsana Maharaj, and then it's 24 7. You know Varsana Maharaj? He, he, he's a Gorakata lover. It doesn't matter what time of the year. Very, you know, he. 
his face lights up, and yeah, you know, it's like Badahari when he starts kirtan. Mm -hmm. It's like that, and you know, and he goes on and on, and you know, he gets lost. It's very sweet, very absorbed. Okay, any comments? Leela Kata doesn't leave many comments. Do you have something? This not a comment. I just was wondering the kind of education that that was happening at that time. Kind of what? Education. The studies that everyone is doing. The grammar. Uh, I don't know what else, but it, there is. That was the kind of teacher he was. He was a grammar student, a grammar teacher. Grammar and what goes with grammar is logic, tarka. Mm. We don't find that that kind of education in modern societies, right? No, there, there's traditional Sanskrit schools that teach that, yeah. But modern education, no. You know, you you know why? Sanskrit was the 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 route to the Vedas. Before one can study the Vedas, one has to learn the tools for studying the Vedas. So that's what Mahaprabhu was providing and it's, you know the edu child education was providing access to to wisdom of the vedas in all different fields so they would learn different things once they got the tools modern education is all about getting a job there is no it's about vocational courses yeah. doing something yeah. it's nothing about uh, studying with us, so there's no such goal at all. Well, the, the, there's some places make other attempts. I, I uh, well, other than get into what what modern education does and doesn't do. There, there, there are other schools of thought besides just that, but largely it's just that. I'll share something. Jai Sachi Nandana, you know him, from Portland. He's an oncologist. You know who I mean? I heard. You heard. Uh, he's from North India. And uh, so when his daughter was entertaining going to school, he was encouraging her to consider University of Chicago because he was a medical teacher and practitioner at the University of Chicago Medical School before he went to Portland. And he said to her, which I've heard from others that also have graduated from University of Chicago, their, their philosophy of education is, we want our students to desire to learn. We're not here, we're not placing emphasis on career placement. They do have recruiters come and do you know what, what they do at colleges. But our educational paradigm is students should want to learn. And when they're doing something that they like and they're learning something that they like, they'll find an occupation they like. That's their, you know, that's not our mission is getting people jobs. You know, some people that's like, that's their credential. You graduate from this school, this high school, you get in so many students get into Ivy League schools, blah, blah, blah. And those that go to Ivy League schools, so many get placements and blah, blah, blah. So they have, it's a different. But you know, Vedic education is, you know, the, the, the paradigm is far gone. Now, there are schools. There are schools. 
the Bhaktivedanta Academy in Mayapur, there they, you know, value themselves as being a traditional gurukul, with you know, in principle and an application of principle, this and that. I don't know how to evaluate how how good a job they're doing. But the, but the the plan or the you know the, the model is very different. Vedic education. And Prabhupada wanted the Vedic education. You know, academics not so important. That was his position. And there's different educators that have different philosophies of education. That's natural. Okay. Thank you. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Um, I, I was appreciating uh, um, Kolaj Sridhar and uh, Mahaprabhu's uh, dealings. Can't understand, but uh, simply I really get inspired by that uh, loving exchanges. And uh, uh, I was thinking like... Uh, um, the loving, what is the base of that loving relationship? Like, you not know, to to have loving re- relationships uh, with the devotees or within the family members. Uh, what is the base for? The basis is service. Of any loving relationship, and then. Uh, there's there's there are varieties of flavors. And you know, customized for each person what what their their taste is. Their their you know, innate, inborn natural taste for service, loving exchange. And there's 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 categories, you know parent and child and this and that. There's categories. Okay? Service. In the in the language of Rupa Goswami it's Thai Bhav. Steady ecstasy. And when steady ecstasy or stai bhav mixes with this and that, then it becomes rasa. And then there's varieties amongst categories of rasa. But the the, the foundation or the axle upon which the rasa turns is stai bhav, a particular type. But it's all service. There's a verse in Chaitanya Charitamrita it's a detail because there's not a lot of discussion going on. Lord Chaitanya declares in Majalila that I, I've come to this world to deliver four four types of love. And the one he leaves out is is Shanta. But it starts with Dasya. In the mood of Vrindavan. You know, so that's that's what he came to give. So that's that's the essence. From that, then it gets Additional elements, additional elements, additional elements. Dasya. Service. You have something? Yeah. Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj. I think uh, you you mentioned Ishwari Ishwarapuri came to Advaita Acharya's home in a in a disguise. Is there a reason? He wasn't wearing sannyas attire. It doesn't elaborate. He wasn't wearing, carrying Tridanda and wearing the attire of a sannyasi. It doesn't say what he was doing. It's just he was in disguise. Madhavendra Puri, at least we're, we're accustomed to seeing pictures of Madhavendra Puri as having his Tridanda. 
Ishwarapuri was his disciple. In disguise. Okay? Another question. Yeah. So, Maharaj, I, these stories are very profound and very sweet. And do we have any pictures which like elevates this to see like any pictures related to these stories? As well? Few, yeah. not many. You know, Krishna Lila has many and Gaur Lila has few. This pastime of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu where he displays so much of his uh, erudition in uh, Vedic knowledge was reminding me of the verse from Gita where Krishna describes himself that he is Veda with. And this one, the, the pastimes of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu that we have been reading, mm. is, is like basically like a demonstration of yes. that uh, particular uh, uh, quality of the Supreme Lord. Yes. And at the same time, I also was comparing and contrasting when he came as Lord Ram, like that mood was completely different. Yes. And very obedient to his uh, superiors and there was nothing of uh, what we see in Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's Leela and each one of them he he was like perfectly in that uh, avatar and that role that he was in uh, that I was just appreciating how, how it's very variegated but at the same time he was like perfect in each one of those uh, pastimes. Very nice observation very nice very nice. And Leela wise, there's a purpose. One is instructing this, another is instructing that. And the, the, the feature that he exhibited was to fulfill this or that. You know, the ideal king and being the emblem of virtue and submissive to the instruction of his father and placing everything else subordinate to that one thing and but you know then exhibiting divinity in other ways by killing Ravan and, and, and the Rakshasas and, and Mahaprabhu was, was different anything? okay this comment is fine Thank you. It just when um, um, when we hear these pastimes, we become attracted. Yes. <laughs> but then, uh, when we are doing other things, then they go in the back of our mind. They don't really stay in the front of our. So you're talking about the stai bhava, where you constantly remember those steady ecstasy, steadiness. So that's something even we relish it when we hear it but it doesn't stay. So, maybe if you can just advise sure. what's the, what can we do? Yes. Good. I, I like that question because it, you know, it's, it's very practical. It, practical in, in the sense that what's needed is it, it begs the question of further stages of bhakti. Like, you know, there's there's regulation and then there's going beyond simply regulation. And the going beyond simply regulation happens when uh, there's some particular absorption. And with that, just like there are, you know, someone someone may develop I know devotees that have their, they read the Bhagavatam, but their particular fascination or their loving attraction is they worship Lord Nishingadeva or they worship Lord Ramachandra or within one family. <laughs> he has and you know, someone else has and someone else has. And so it's, it comes out 
of their heart while they're hearing the same thing. But there's a, a, a prominent, and, and when that prominent absorption comes, and it just keeps going further and further and further with, uh, you know, it, it's the Raghunuga Bhakti stage. When, where a particular mood of devotion for Krishna has captured one's heart, like I was just describing with Varsana Maharaj. And because I know him, I have a relationship with him. I, I knew when he was, when he first started coming to the Brooklyn Temple. He lived in New Jersey, and, you know, it was Bhakta. Jack came to the temple. And, you know, he had just an attraction for country life, so he went to New Vrindavan. He lived in the temple for some time, but it was just, that wasn't his heart. So, he, And when he was in New Vrindavan, he was, t he was uh, at earth, he was in charge of the heavy earth-moving equipment. And after they, you know, helped do that, it was then looking after the animals. So he was, he learned, he, he told me, he learned how to train animals to plow the field that he would stand at the outside by the fence. And he would just give verbal signals and they would go up and down and make rows and, you know, plow the field. So, you know, that was his occupation. But internally, because he had time, his absorption went into, he and Radhanath Maharaj, they were, because they were brahmacharis together, became very, very, very absorbed in Gorlila. And they were reading, you know, stuff that nobody knew what, what, what it was. But, you know, <clears throat> reading it and reading it and reading it, discussing it and discussing it, discussing it and getting absorbed and getting absorbed. So, Radha Maharaj's devotional service went in a certain direction and Varsana Maharaj just has stayed in Nuvrindavan. But, he, you know, he's steeped up to his, you know, in Gorlila. So it's it's not just it doesn't come and go for him. It's it's an absorption. He still has some external activity, but there's an absorption. And without going into it, there's other examples without anecdotal examples. But there's there naturally a stage of bhakti may, in due to course of time, evolve where there's a particular attraction for a feature, an aspect of the supreme lord. There was this question um, the other day I heard being discussed in a recorded class. Shridhar Swami, our, you know, the, the predecessor to Gaur Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, the commentator in the Bhagavatam, his Ishtadev was Lord Dishingadev. So the question was, how was it he understood the Bhagavatam as he understood the Bhagavatam? And, you know, very deep and profound, yet Dishingadev was his Yesterday was the Lord of his heart. So that happens. You know, broad-minded people can have, a, a, but they, the, the, you know, Krishna Tattva, they also have their affinity in their heart. And it, it comes about in, in a, not a contrived way, but a natural way. So when, when that stage of attachment comes, then it doesn't come and go because it's attachment. But the attachment doesn't come by pasting it and gluing it and, you know, scotch taping it on. It comes from within. And it comes from, you know, the, a, a proper hearing and chanting, starting with chanting and hearing. And then, you know, a, a, a profound attraction and so forth, becoming a follower of within internally within one's heart it's a stage of bhakti there's some devotees that love ramayana and they you know they they're they're going through life and they're dealing with stuff in life and you know you you pause and they're going to say something that's from ramayana that the situation they're passing through reminds them there, there's some lesson to be learned from Ramayana, because they, you know, that's where their heart is. That's so you know, it's nice. It's an it's a natural e evolving stage of bhakti.
it, it starts with the hearing and chanting, you know, what we're doing. And then the hearing and chanting and then getting back into worldly stuff. And then it doesn't mean you, you dismiss the worldly stuff. It just means the absorption becomes more deep and more profound and doesn't evaporate or just get covered over. It becomes your life and soul. Maturing stage of hearing and chanting. Anything over here? Oh, kitchen folks, do you have something you want to add here? Anything? Okay. We're done. You have something online. Uh, Maharaj, uh, Premitarangani Mataji posted the Bhagavad Gita verse, Apariyaptam Taddatma Asmakam. Bhagavad yes, Gita there, there it is. What's, what's the verse number? Bhagavad Gita 110. 110. Okay. Thank you. And this question is from Radhika Mataji, Hare Krishna Maharaj, Dandavat Pranams. What is the qualification for entering into the Leela, both good and bad? Submissive hearing. I don't know what the good and bad means. <laughs> Next question is from uh, Shriya Mataji. Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj, is there a deeper meaning in Chaitanya Mahaprabhu not talking about Krishna during his childhood ch yeah. childhood education? Yeah. He's showing by Leela becoming a devotee. His Leela is to show the topmost love of Radha. And he's starting from he's not even a devotee. And so how does one who is not yet a devotee become a devotee? And there's elements. And the each this this chapter we just read is a big one. Contact with Ishwarapuri, Sadhu Sangha. And hearing from the sadhu and rendering service to the sadhu and offering meals to the sadhu and those kinds of, you know, things. So it's it's that the that's the meaning. There's a secondary meaning I've said six times, and that is he wasn't a pushover, he wasn't a softy, he wasn't like, you know, weak-minded, and therefore the weak-minded become um, sentimental devotees because they, they don't have sufficient horsepower, intellectual horsepower, so they become sentimental devotees. He was showing the opposite, you know, extreme opposite. Okay, that's it. Srila Prabhupada Ki. Thank